that you have joined us today uh, for this presentation on behalf of um, the Burgoyne Wine Board in Chablis that I'm doing this presentation uh, about Chablis. So just a couple of housekeeping details if I can get everybody to mute themselves. That would be fantastic uh, so we can all hear each other. Uh, it is helpful if you're not on camera simply because I think your, uh, your internet connection will be a little bit better if you're not on camera. Now, just to say that everyone has two wines, including myself. So I would really appreciate um, some feedback and a lovely discussion about the tasting. I have a list of who's got what wines. So at that point, if you, you know, unmute yourself and put a camera on, that would be great. As far as questions, you can type them in under the meeting chat if you want, but I will leave time after each section for uh, people to have questions and then time um, uh, at the end. So uh, we can do questions as well. Uh, so I think that's it with regards to um, housekeeping. So if we can, oops, I've got somebody that's not on mute. Can I get everybody on mute? Uh, I'm not quite sure who's not on that'll mute. That'll be me. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Who's, who's me? Great. Okay, super. Uh, fantastic. So if we want to start with a presentation, that would be terrific. Thank you, Bertil. So Bertil, if we can put that, is it working? Can we put it on? There we go. Fantastic. Great. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the region first. And as I said, uh, this is on behalf of the Burgoyne Wine Board and Chablis that I am doing this, just to give you a little bit of background information, but more importantly, to get an experience of, uh, of the uniqueness uh, of the Chablis region. So just a little bit about uh, Chablis and uh, in France and around the world. There we go. Uh, so you can see that uh, out of uh, Burgoyne, 4.1% of French production, uh, just a little under half is exported. But when you see the lower part of that slide, you see Chablis is 16% of Burgoyne of that 4.1%. But the uniqueness here is that 66% is exported. So this really is a wine that is really uh, appreciated, not only in France, but around the world. So exactly who is buying it? So as you can see, we, um, uh, we're looking at 38% is bought within Europe and 28% is bought outside of Europe. So when we look at that, you can see that the UK is more than double the next largest uh, foreign market for them, which is the US. The US and Japan are both equal at 11%, and then we have Sweden and then by Canada. So it is really a wine that is well appreciated here, which I'm sure you know more of uh, than I do. So let's see exactly where it's located in France. And you can actually see it's one of the five regions in Bourgogne. It's located halfway between Paris and Bonn, and it is in that northern quarter. So we are talking about a northern area in that sort of, you can see how continental that particular area uh, is. I think what's more unique is the history of this region because uh, it's got a really long history. And most of you that have been to Burgoyne know that there are evidence of Roman ruins. So we know the Romans were, were very active there, four different villas up and down the Burgoyne region. But it really was the monks, so first the Benedictine and the Cistercian monks, who actually are an offshoot of Benedictine monks, that really contributed to that development of growing. And we know that they have abundance of records there with regards to plots and uh, conditions and climates that really, really advanced it. As far as its reputation, uh, it really was through the rivers, so they were able to get it out through the rivers and through canals and flat bottom boats. So it started to gain a reputation uh, in Paris and particularly, and then outside of Paris, more widely outside of Paris. But I think like every region in France, it was really the, the uh, late 1800s uh, with phylloxera 
that that obviously devastated the region. Uh, and then when they had a solution for phylloxera, and you know Bordeaux and Burgoyne are both the same in this, they they really had uh, a lot of fraud, and there was more uh, Chablis being sold around the world than really was produced. So they needed to do something about it and established uh, sort of more of a local union in 1908. That momentum was a little bit stalled by uh, World War One, and then we go into the 30s with the creation of Appellation Controle, uh, which uh, Chablis uh, two appellations were created at that time in 1938, uh, AOC Chablis and then Chablis Grand Cru, and then we had World War Two. The history afterwards is more one to do with growing and the increase in quality and production, and that is um, the solutions for frost. And as I alluded to earlier, this is an area that is uh, far north, and we had um, the first solutions for frost, uh, which really made a difference. And when I talk about the climate, we'll go into that uh, a little bit more. So what makes Chablis Chablis? Why is it unique? Why is it one of a kind? And that really is to do with something called terroir. So terroir, the first thing is soil. And as you all know, there's plenty of Chardonnay around the world. So why is the Chardonnay very different? And it is the soil. So Chablis at the time and Paris at the time was part of the Paris Basin, which was a low, shallow sea. That's about 150 million years ago. And when it dried up, uh, it left huge deposits of uh, calcium carbonate or limestone, but also there was a lot of fossils. And actually, if you look, I don't know how clearly you can see into that picture, that big rock there actually has a little bit of a shell. So when you take a look at this, this is uh, limestone and uh, a compact clay limestone, which a lot of small oysters and small um, fossils or shells in it called Exogera virgilia. And that's, that's the definition of what we call chimerigen clay. There's two different types of soils. So if we actually take a look at the picture on the next slide, you can actually see that we've got, there, there's the picture of the chimerigen clay on your right. But on your left, we do have a slightly later soil, so developed later, called Portlandian. And those of you that do know soils uh, here in, uh, in the United Kingdom, Portlandian is very much a dominant soil that we have. So you can see where that's almost a more pure, harder limestone soil. And that is, um, that is on the upper, that's on the upper layers and the plateaus, and I'll, I'll point that out. And we're going to have a couple of cross sections. So we have these two dominant soils. The older is the Kimmeridgen on your right, and the slightly younger, if you can say that, is on your left, is the Portlandian soil. So these are the two dominant soil structures. So we'll take a look at a couple of cross sections of where that soil exists in a couple of maps. So you can see the Portlandian really is your, uh, your darker blue and the lighter blue is the Kimmeridgen. And it is where, it's where the, the, um, the erosion of the river actually has happened and exposed the Kimmeridgen is where you do see it. Portlandian tends to be on the slightly higher plateaus where it hasn't been eroded because Kimmeridgen is underneath. And it's where that Kimmeridgen, um, where the soil has been eroded and the Kimmeridgen is exposed is where you do have your top terroirs. But they, 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 they both um, are there in, um, in, in, in the particular area. So another cross section on the next slide is a little bit uh, more how you can see it. So just looking at more of a two dimensional on the next slide. There you go here. So you can see where Portlandian is a little bit on the higher. It tends to be on the plateaus and you can see where the erosion has happened uh, and that's been washed away. The Portlandian's washed away. You can see the Kimmeridgen clay sort of right uh, under underneath. And that's that's that sort of uh, the, with just an exceptional amount of fossils. So anybody who's been there, usually a producer will have kind of a chunk in their tasting room and you can really see it. And you can actually see the shells uh, in the soils as well. So in combination with the soil, we do have a really well-known and very popular grape, and that is Chardonnay. So it is the only grape that is allowed, or only white grape that is allowed uh, in uh, Chablis. Uh, so we are looking at the expression of Chardonnay in these two soils. So uh, I know that um, as I said, everyone has had lots of Chardonnay for around the world. And it, it is, you know, why is Chablis so different? Why is it particularly uh, unique? Uh, and, it, and it is this expression in these two soils. 
But in combination with that, it really is that climate. So if we take a look at our next slide, I love this slide because I love the pictures in this slide. It's from the 2016 vintage. And as I said, and you saw in one of our earlier maps, this is Northern continental climate. So generally we're talking about cold winters, um, short but hot summers. And the, the, the issue with these sort of slightly longer and colder winters is frost. Chardonnay is an early butter and and frost is an issue. And, and as we saw in the historical slide in the late 50s, there was sort of the first solution to frost. Before that, the, the, the growers just would, you know, know that they were going to have a low volume if they had a, a, a frost year. So when the buds do tend, when the buds push out, and this is an issue with Chardonnay in a lot of cool climates areas, and you do have this type of climate, you are going to be at risk. And if you do lose your buds, you are going to lose you're going to lose your production for that particular year. So we start hearing a lot about this in the last couple of years because of global warming. And when we do have these, what I call Aprils, late March, Aprils that are really quite warm, the sap is going to start running in these grapes and the buds are going to push out. So in the bottom left hand slide, you can see where the bud has pushed out. And in Chablis, that can be very dangerous. You know, you can have frost and cold nights you know, up until mid-May, really. And so if we have these um, early warm springs with buds pushing out, we are always going to risk frost. But what makes Shadley unique, as opposed to some other areas uh, with the recent frost issues, is they've been dealing with this. They've been dealing with this, you know, for hundreds of years. And, you know, the, they've had the solutions now for it for the past 70 years. So these are some wonderful pictures. And the two top, both left and right, show you sort of sort of what I call the traditional ways to deal with frost. And that is um, the, the, the fires. So we call them smudge pots. And anybody who's been in, in southern England um, can see that they're used there as well. So it's just really creating this warm environment around the vine. So the frost doesn't settle. It doesn't drain down and doesn't settle. But more recent innovations are a couple of different things. There's heated cables that will keep the vine warm. But uh, a simple thing, which is spraying. So you can actually see where spraying is done and it looks unusual because it doesn't look green at all, but where spraying is done. And that is really to coat uh, the vine and coat particularly that bud and create sort of an igloo or a little cocoon for it and, and make the temperature around zero. So not to go below zero and actually keep the inside of that, you know, ice cocoon warmer than the outside. And that's been an extremely effective. So it's, it's interesting where water is used here more for frost than it is for irrigation. So, you know, with what I'd say the soil, with the grape and with this unique climate, um, that's, that's part of what we call terroir. But that is always enhanced and different imprints by the producers. And there's many people there where the generations uh, have been there for quite a long time in Chablis that make their wine. And I think what makes this area fascinating is you have one grape, yet you have very different expressions, which I'm hoping we'll taste today. And that's really the imprint of these producers, yet how they do express Chardonnay. So they're getting this you know, wonderful product from this terroir working very hard that they get sort of the, you know, the best, healthiest expression of it uh, through frost protection. Um, um, and it's how they make it. It's how they put their particular imprint on it. So there's around 300 estates there producing around 10,000 bottles. Uh, one of them is a co-op, so a very well-known and established uh, cooperative uh, is responsible for about a quarter of production. And then there's about 100 negociants, so 100 merchants there uh, that uh, work there as well. So that is our definition of terroir, and to me, that is why Chablis is unique. Um, I'll ask and see if there's any questions at this part, if anybody wants to unmute themselves, if there's any, any questions. Anyone? Okay. So uh, let's go into um, our tasting, our wine. So the next slide we are looking at, we're looking very much at uh, the 2018 vintage. 
So everybody's got 2018. So that's the first thing I want to say. So everybody's uh, everybody's bottles are 2018. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on tasting the different levels, but also the expression in 2018. So if everybody remembers, I know it was a long time ago, two years, but it really was one of those uh, dream vintages. Lots of water. Uh, we had quite a wet, wet winter um, I think here also in Shebley, but that really helped boost water reserves. And with global warming, there, there is an issue with lack of water these days in these hot summers. So there was lots of water reserves that year. And growth did become early. We had quite a warm spring. So it's always one of those times when I think growers in Shebley sort of, you know, cross their fingers and, and are, you know, just hope for no frost. And they didn't have any frost, which was great. Now they did have hail and hail is something that is happening the more extremer climate gets. So hail did hit um, three communes. So where I would say other areas are not as used to coping with frost, Shebley is, but you know, a, a lot of areas now are having to deal with hail. So three communes, but it didn't overly impact volume too, too much. And after that, it really was the perfect spring, um, spring and summer, to be honest. And if everybody, I don't know if everybody remembers, but we had something like 10 weeks of stunningly beautiful blue sky and uh, quite hot weather. So no disease here, hot, sunny and dry. Didn't have a lot of rainfall. So thankfully the winter time, um, really brought up those water reserves and they were able, the, the grapes were able to cope, which was absolutely great. Um, the wines were able to be harvested. So we just have, it's, it really was one of those years where it was a bountiful harvest with just wonderful, wonderful quality and a slightly what I would say richer. So just richer fruit still with that distinctive acidity. And I'll talk more about that when we taste the wines because that, that, that really is uniqueness of, of the Kimmeridge and clay. Um, um, so really a terrific vintage and very similar to something like 2015. So if anybody's got 2015 or got 2000, uh, uh, 2015 on their list, then 2018 is not dissimilar from 2015. So let's review the four levels of Appalachian before we get into the tasting. There we go. So we've got four levels of Appalachian. Uh, and I think that, you know, it, it's, it's beautiful and simple, I think, in Chablis to understand. So we've got, um, we've got two village Appalachians, uh, Petit Chablis and Chablis. And then we've got Premier Cru Appalachian and a Grand Cru Appalachian. So what we have, you can see Petit Chablis on our triangle. It's about 19% um, a volume. That's about 1,100 hectares. That has increased. So those of you that are going to be on the Petit Chablis uh, call next week, we'll talk about that. So it's one area that has expanded and it's become more popular. The next area is Chablis. So that's 66% of production. So that is the bulk of what we do see. And that's uh, just under 3,700 hectares. Mm -hmm. Then we've got Premier Cru, uh, and that's 14% of production, and that's just under 800 hectares. And then at the top, we have Grand Cru, which is uh, 101 hectares, and that's 1% of production. So uh, just under 5,700 uh, 5, hectares in total. And the average the last four years has been around 38 million bottles. So if we look at a map that just uh, of the four levels, and there you can see it there. And I think that this map just really shows you um, where the areas are. And we can see Chablis Grand Cru in red. And you can see how quite tiny it is. And it's actually on, on the right bank. So we have very much right bank, left bank here. Um, you can see Premier Cru, which is the dark, very, very dark orange. It exists on both sides of the river and as does Chablis and Petit Chablis. I think someone is not muted. So if somebody can mute themselves, that'd be great. So we're going to do the tasting in sort of what I call two sections. We're going to focus on the first two levels, and that'll be uh, Petit Chablis and Chablis. Michelle? Could I just ask a quick question about those Grand Cru sites? Yeah. You know the the Premier Cru's bordering those Grand Cru sites. Could they ever become Grand Cru? In order to become Grand Cru, so you're talking a Premier Cru. 
Yes, but particularly there where the premier crew is right on the border of the... No, really good question. Um, you you have to apply. So one of, one of the ways that you increase to a higher level is the producers need to get together and do an application. So all the producers need to agree. Uh, they do a formal application to the INAO. And then the INAO will take that forward. And one of the things they'll do is they'll consult into... Um, the Grand Cru producers that are there. So not that it can't happen, it certainly can. And we certainly do see in Burgoyne, uh, certainly we see Premier Cru's um, being appointed. Uh, I think a Grand Cru is a little bit more difficult to get that passed, not that that wouldn't be impossible. What we can do is, uh, Francoise from uh, Chablis, um, from BIVB and, and representing Chablis is on the call. So Francoise, I don't know if you can comment on that question. And also vice versa. I mean, can Grand Cru drop out of Grand Cru and be pushed into Premier Cru? I, look, at the actual classification is never going to be pushed out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're, they're never going to take a piece of land and say, no, that's no longer Grand Cru. What can happen is through the approval process. So uh, every wine needs to be approved. It goes up against chemical analysis, tasting analysis, you know, whether you're at the table wine category or an AOC or a village or premier cru. So in that tasting analysis, it needs to act, walk, talk like a grand cru wine. So theoretically, could they come off and say, this doesn't taste like a grand cru, you know, you're, you're not eligible for grand cru. Yes, that is possible through the tasting and chemical analysis. I would like to think that grand cru producers are, are doing such a good job that that wouldn't happen. Um, but they, they, you know, it, it is always possible that like they couldn't get permission in that particular vintage to use Grand Cru because something happened in the tasting and chemical analysis. But as far as reclassifying that piece of land, I think that is a much, a much more difficult um, process. Francois, oh, yeah. are you there? Are you able to talk about uh, upgrading any of the Chablis Premier Cru's to Grand Cru? I don't know if she's there. She might be on the end of the call. So what I'll do, Ryan, is we'll talk a little bit more formally about the Grand Cruz and see if she um, and see if she's on, on if she's okay. on the call, and then Thanks, we can uh, we can ask her. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so Bertil, if we can go back to to the slides. There we go. Okay, so Petit Chablis. So this is this is the area that is dominant Portlandian. And I think you can see by this map how they're, it's almost on the outskirts. It's almost on the edges. These are on the plateaus. So if we had a 3D map, you would look at this and you would see that slightly higher, slightly away on flatter land, but higher. So that's where you get the 230 to 280 meters. And that's where the Portlandian hasn't eroded. So that is what's classified um, as Petit Chablis. So you can see surface hectares uh, just slightly over 1,100. And, and because of the focus is next week, I'll talk a bit more about that. That ha actually has increased. So there's a real uh, rejuvenation of Petit Chablis and some really incredible wines coming out of, of Petit Chablis. So our first producer is, uh, we've got a 2018 Domaine Vaucore Fils. And uh, myself and two other people have this. So um, I'll, I'll talk first and then I'll, 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 get, I'll see if any, any of the other two individuals uh, want to talk about it. Um, so Domaine Vaucouré, so quite a well-known 40 hectares, that's quite a lot in Chablis, uh, third generation. So two brothers that are running it, one brother is looking after the vines, the other one is looking after um, uh, making the wine. Um, so here you've got the clay limestone, but it's dominant Portlandian southwest so they've got one hectare uh, in Petit Chablis 20 year old vines. As far as uh, winemaking and I'm going to talk a bit about winemaking all throughout it and how producers put their imprint on these wines. So here we have all use of stainless steel so alcoholic fermentation in stainless steel. They also do let this wine undergo malolactic fermentation again in stainless steel. A little bit about malolactic fermentation, those of you that, um, I know it's been a long time since any of us have kind of been 
doing any serious wine stuff, but uh, malolactic fermentation is really converting that really hard, tangy malic acid into lactic acid. So it, it, it serves two purposes. It serves to soften the acidity a bit, but also to give a bit of a texture and a bit more sort of creaminess to it and a little bit of flavor as well. So it is something, because mm. we're far north, that is quite common mm. in winemaking for Chablis. That being said, and I think if, if you take a look at uh, Champagne, which is not that far away, that's something very common in Champagne as well that they employ. That being said, sometimes it is less employed in hotter years um, to combat sort of what I would call global warming. But for the most part, I think you'll see producers uh, uh, having the wine undergoing malolactic. So in this particular instance, this is not for butter. And I know we always think of malolactic for butter, this is not to give that flavor. It really is to give soften the acidity, to give a little bit different texture and almost a creaminess to it as opposed to a butteriness to it. Um, a lot of times stainless steel is used. That is, that is sort of the um, choice of a producer using stainless steel. Uh, a lot of times you get some producers that are really quite... Um, their ethos or their philosophy is really to protect the fruit. Uh, and some producers will use a combination of stainless steel and wood. And I think we'll see that as we go through the tasting. Um, so I don't know if, I think I've got Theo and, and Jess Bree, if I said that right, that do have this wine. So if you want to give me your, I can give you my impression of it. Um, I quite like this producer. I think Petit Chablis to me, it's maybe doesn't have the, the real tangy, steely, a uh, tight linear acidity that I think maybe Chablis and the Premier Clues have. Uh, but I think that's not a bad thing. I think it just is. It's still got great acidity. There's maybe a little bit more roundness, a uh, little bit more apple fruit in it, as opposed to this real, you know, severe sort of lemon tangy fruit, um, which is why I quite like it, which I, why I think it's a bit more popular. So I think this, this expresses that. It expresses the vintage You've got a bit more ripeness here. There's a bit more red or apple, yellow apple, still with a bit of lemon in it. Uh, and it's just a really, it's a really nice drinking wine. So I don't know whether um, Theo or Jespri wants to uh, comment on what they thought of this particular one. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I think very similar to what you've been saying. It's delicious, first off. I was thinking it's the most important thing to say about a wine. Um, that creaminess that you were saying, certainly it isn't butter, but kind of that, with that combination of those apple fruit flavors it's just a wonderful wonderful um, mouthfeel which makes it very very drinkable and approachable terrific thank you very much anybody was that theo or is that jesper sorry that was theo that was theo okay jesper did i say your name right yes oh hi sorry yeah you said my name that's right okay. sorry i just got the bottle now i'm just opening it <laughs> okay that's great um, Theo, I absolutely agree with you. I, you know, there's people have. What, what are your What are people's impressions of Petit Chablis? Is it something that you're selling more of? Something Something that's coming back? Um, you know, pe are people happy to have it by the glass? What are some other people's impressions of it? Anyone? Anyone? Hi, Michelle. I would say that probably from my perspective, that it still suffers from being seen as inferior. Yeah, okay. On Chablis, they want Chablis, not Petit Chablis. Um, maybe the pricing, um, maybe the prices will change over time and that people will accept Petit Chablis a bit more, but I think it still, it still suffers from that image. Yeah, and you know, look at this is something that I've, I've heard the last couple of years and going around and, and, and doing these presentations um, which why I think it's really important for people to taste it, because I do think these are far better than perhaps what they might have been even 15 years ago. And I think that's why you're kind of seeing a rebound. But yeah, it's up to us, I think, as educators to introduce someone and say, I just think because it's a little bit fruitier and maybe not as linear, it's a little bit easier to have it by the glass. So it's it's still got what people love about Chablis, but it's just not as maybe tart and acidic. And it really depends on your type of client. But I think that's why I really quite like this one as either a, a you know, by the glass option or you know, just with starters. Jasper, are, are, have you tasted it? Can you comment on it? 
Um, to be honest, um, my kind of perception of um, Petit Chablis, because you, you kind of get it, it's not going to have that much complexity. Um, but this is really, this is really good. Like, uh, I'd be interested to know, um, like, price-wise, where it sits. So I'm not quite sure whether we have prices for them, Bertil. What I can do, Bertil, do we have prices for them? But what I can do is I can get them sent uh, to you guys with respect to prices. Usually, Michelle, Petit Chablis. Yeah. It's right. probably about twelve nine nine in Majestic. Yeah, I was just going to say usually anywhere between twelve and sort of sixteen, depending on the producer. Yeah, and they import that directly. So. <laughs> yeah, and this good. is this is actually you know this is a smaller producer. I think what's interesting about the Petit Chablis, yes, you have big producers that are producing it, but there's a lot of smaller producers, a lot of younger producers that are going in and revolving these vineyards. And I do think going forward, these are going to be a real revelation to people. I think. Um, I sort of see this in other areas of Burgoyne's areas that, that maybe weren't as popular and you're getting younger producers going in and really reviving these areas. And I think Petit Chablis is one of them. And I think that's why you're seeing a, a real expansion of the area and a rejuvenation of the area. But I think from a price point of view, depending on when you get it, but yeah, I think anywhere between sort of that 12, 16, you know, if it's a real, real sort of, you know, well-known, recognized producer, you might pay a little bit more for it. So I don't know if that helps, Jesper. Yes, no, that's really good. Did you like it? I did. Um, I've, I've not really had, well, just generally when you go to places and if, if it's had by the glass, it's generally seen as an option to do a cheaper, cheaper wine that has shabby in it, but yeah. this is actually a, a good wine. Um, yeah. Good, great. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much for both Theo and Jesper for, for letting us know what they think. So let's go on to uh, Chablis. Uh, we've got two different wines in, in, in Chablis for us, to, uh, for us to taste. So I will be uh, calling on, again, a few people. I don't have any of the Chablis wines, so that's why I will depend on you guys to tell me what you think. So we're looking at Chablis. Now you see the difference. You see if we move a little bit closer to the river, quite a bit larger area, and this is dominantly Kimmeridgen. So these are, are, are areas that have had that erosion of Portlandian and that Kimmeridgen clay. And for me, the planting of, of Chardonnay on Kimmeridgen, it really is, it is a soil that just doesn't allow uh, a lot of heat. It, it is very lean soil. Um, the good thing about it is it does absorb water. The, the, the roots can tunnel down, but it just doesn't allow this voluptuous, you know, ripeness. Um, it really slows down ripening. And I, and I think that gives it that really um, tangy, steely, wet chalk element to it. And I think that's even more emphasized when we get into the Premier Cruz and Grand Cruz. Just to let you know, in the areas that are dominantly Kimmeridgen, the deepest parts of it are, are, are sometimes 100 to 150 meters. So it can be quite deep depending on where you are, the Kimmeridgen. But this is really the first expression that we're going to get of that, what I call that Chablis kind of tang. It is the largest area. So we've just got under 3,600 uh, hectares. So we've got two wines here. And uh, the first one is from a really well-known producer, and it's something that we do see a lot of this producer and great reputation in this country, and that's William Fevre. So it's a producer that's been around for a long time, but it was uh, bought out by the Henriot uh, Champagne family in 1998. So 78 hectares. 40% of that 78 are in Premier Cru and Grand Cru. So they do have a lot of real premium uh, land. Um, so for this particular, this is uh, Chablis, so it is from the Kimmeridgen. They've got different plots that they do blend together. So 46, just under 47 hectares is Chablis. So both sides of the river, and I think you saw that with the map where you've got Chablis on both sides of the river. And, you know, this is where a winemaker really crafts it. So taking those different plots and understanding what they want. Uh, to express in their sort of flagship Chablis wine. So they'll have those different plops, they'll ferment them um, all individually separately and then do a blending and taste them. 
Um, so here, slightly different winemaking that we're using here. So they are using stainless steel, both al alcoholic and malolactic are being done in stainless steel. But you see that anywhere, depending on the vintage, between 90 and 9, uh, pardon me, between 10 and 5% will be put in old oak. And this is the first start that we're going to see of a little bit of wood. So I talked about the use of malolactic fermentation. Really, the use of older oak is just to build a different flavor profile. It's really introducing a slight bit of oxygenation. It's really to build that slightly honey, slightly nutty flavor and really blend it with that purity of fruit that's in that stainless steel. So along with the malolactic, softening up the acidity, bringing a slightly sort of um, creaminess to it. Um, that sort of honeyed, slightly nuttiness. And the other thing is lees aging. So five to six months, you would uh, have some lees aging to really get a good expression of lees. You do need at least sort of five to six months. So the lees do break down. Uh, and that's really giving a different texture to the wine as well. So we have, you know, we have what I call sort of the four levels of winemaking done, done in this particular wine. So three people have this wine. We've got Ryan, Josh, and Anna have this wine. I don't. So if uh, if somebody wants to taste it and talk to me about it. Hi, Michelle. Um, so, can't hear you. Um, so yeah, I can absolutely only agree. Um, it's when I first poured it into the glass, the first thing I got was some creaminess from it. And when I tasted it the first time around, which was like three minutes ago or something, I really got this very, this green apple, very strong green apple flavor. And um, after that, it sat a while in the glass and had a little bit of air, a little bit of time to breathe. And after that, the, um, the French oak really comes through you really get oak on the nose and really get a different structure. Um, the more oxidative aromas are coming through more and more, which is absolutely beautiful. So it really develops very quite nicely in the glass. Um, it also gets something a little bit wooly almost, something warm, wooly in, in there. And um, Underneath, you still have this this beautiful freshness and then this kind of a chalky finish, which is really, really lovely. I think it's an absolutely lovely wine. Um, very, very well made and with a lot of nuance and a lot of layer. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, who else has got this? Josh, Ryan? Um, Michelle, I'll, yeah, I'll reiterate that. Uh, first of all, I'm an iconic producer. Uh, absolutely delicious wine. You're quite similar to the to the last person. I mean, you get that sort of apple character, but for me, it's sort of developing into that sort of apple crumble, Bramley apple, cooked apple sort of character, but maintains that lovely sort of thread of acid right through it. And it's nice long length. Uh, and then um, as the last taster said, it has that lovely sort of chalkiness on the back palate. So for me, I mean, it looks like Classic shabby. I've just looked on Vivina, so it's about 20, 21 pounds a bottle, which I think is a, a stonking wine for at that sort of price point. Yeah, I would say from a price, I think you can get it anywhere from sort of seventeen ninety nine. You're absolutely right, sort of twenty twenty one. I, I think. Um, Josh, are you in the call? I think Josh, you are. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, and yeah, I think I agree with both what's been said. Really, I think there's. Um, I think for me, this is when I think of Chablis, this is very much what I think of. It's got that kind of very clean, minerally kind of uh, flavour to it. It's definitely some good acidity to it. And I think the, the kind of nuttiness is, is, there's a hint of that nuttiness. It's not as extreme as I think if I'd seen the wine making notes first, I would have expected, but it's definitely there in the background. But yeah, a really, a really nice Chablis. Great. Can any of you talk to me if you're familiar with it compared, because the 17 is quite different. So this really is... Um, uh, you know, both the wines I have are just slightly richer because of that vintage. Does anybody um, have good experience with the 17 that they want to compare this with? I don't, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah I mean, but 17 was, 17 was a, pretty good, a particularly good vintage. I mean, mm. 18 was, um, I think there's an over, it was, the harvest is very bountiful, let's yeah. put it that way. So sometimes you'd think you'd lack a bit of concentration, but surprisingly, the bottle I'm drinking is got you know good concentration good depth i think that they're, they're completely two different vintages and 
if you had a 17 18 side by side you definitely yeah. pick up the nuances i think 17 was a more of a depends on the hand of the producer it could have been a more warmer tropically inclined vintage um 18 would be more <clears throat> to my palate a more traditional Chablis, Chablis and vintage, Great. I would say. Super, thank you very much. Okay, so let's go on to the uh, next wine. And I think what's really interesting uh, about Chablis, uh, now when we talk about there's almost 3,700 hectares in Chablis. So not surprisingly, you are starting to see a bit of segmentation. Uh, amongst producers for Chablis. And one of the things that I, that I see, which is becoming more common I with, within Chablis itself, is segmenting off Yevin. Now, we know there's no legal, you know, there's no legal element to Yevin. So, you know, the vines can be as old as you want. But I think generally what producers are looking at is 30 plus years, ideally 40 and above. And there are lots of old vines. So producers will either have a particular plot they want to express uh, as a different segment or a different cuvee, or they might, and I've seen producers sort of tag off their old vines and pick them separately and create something else. Uh, and as we know, old vines are generally something that, um, uh, you know, lower yield, little bit richer, a uh, little bit more energy goes to those single particular plants. Uh, so I tend to see different winemaking to it, sometimes a little bit different oak. Uh, so it's quite an interesting different trend that, that we are, are starting to see, people doing uh, uh, what I call their top expression of Chablis. Uh, so this one is the Vieille Vigne from 2018 by Domaine Michel Frère. Um, it's um, family owned since the 50s. Uh, Bernau is uh, running it now, so the son is running it now. Uh, and he's got about 60 hectares that he does work with, uh, most of it on Kim Origin. So this particular is 40-year-old uh, vines. Um, and vinified all in stainless steel. He does do malolactic uh, in stainless steel and then in oak barrels. So oak barrels, various, um, various ages, but older, four, six months on the lees. So not dissimilar to the previous uh, wine. So a number of you have this wine. This is probably one of the ones we, have, we, we were able to get a hold of. So a number of you have it. So I don't have it. So anyone that hasn't um, spoken yet, I would love it if you can talk to me. A couple of people can talk to me about the wine. Uh, oops, Michelle, it's Karen. Um, so I've got this wine and um, on the nose is, is you get that richness and concentration. Um, and then on the palate, again, that sort of richness is coming through. So the warmth of the vintage is, is evident, but it has a beautiful linearity to it. And the, the, um, it, the, the acid is uh, it's crisp, uh, it's taut, it's, it's very refreshing. And that oak, I would never have expected it had that six months in oak. It's so beautifully integrated. I wouldn't have picked that up. I thought that was coming from concentration of fruit, actually. Um, so it's some very, very clever winemaking. Terrific. Anybody else want to comment? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Nick. Um, Hi, Nick. I, I'd agree with the previous um, person. I certainly wouldn't have got the oak. Um, it's got a lovely long finish. I mean, I, I, I had a good sip while you were talking about the previous wines, and I'm still getting that lovely, lengthy, persistent finish. It was nice and honeyed fruit, great acidity. Yeah, I, I just liked it. I thought it was a great wine. Fantastic. Yeah, this I'm, one I'm is... Fantastic, I think. <laughs> okay. This, again, is similarly priced to the previous, so we're looking at sort of around sort of 20-ish. Uh, for this particular wine. So again, just a slightly different expression. Anybody else? I can have another person speak. Anybody else want to talk about the VAV? Um, yeah, so good. So quick question is if you, so when I put it into the glass, normally when you drink quite young Chablis, it's almost got a green tinge to that glass. Mm. However, when you poured this 2018 in, it's actually much more golden in color. Yeah. I would assume that's from the VAV, the, the older vines. Uh, but like everybody said, it's actually for a pretty young vintage drinking exceptionally well. I think the the older vines and the oak barrel fermentation 
the secondary fermentation possibly has helped it balance out much more. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. I look at I think in a really ripe year like 2018, you may not necessarily yeah. get. Thank you, Sean. You may not necessarily get that sort of greenness, and I think it's expression of that. But also, you're absolutely right. That six months. Um, in 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 the oak, and I think what's interesting about this when they use oak and they use mallow, it is that layering of flavor that you are that you are getting. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, three people. I appreciate it. So Karen, Nick, and Sean, to um, tell me what you think. Um, really, I think for both Petit Chablis and Chablis, and it and it's you guys to tell me. Um, you know, obviously by the glass with food. How do you guys sell it? How do you guys serve it? What do people want it? Do they want it with a meal? Do they want it by the glass? Is it both? And I'll throw it out to the group. I think it's Paul here, Michelle. Um, I think this is one that is, is light enough that you bring out with an appetizer or a starter, um, finger food. Um, I don't think it's it's one that you would sort of sit and drink by the glass. It, it's not something that me personally, I would go and order a bottle of this and, and sit and just drink, um, you know, at the bar or at the restaurant. I do think it's something that will really complement something very light. I mean, you know, you, um, your nibbles and what have you. Um, that's my view. Okay, great. How about the Petit Chablis? Would you treat that differently? Is that a more by the glass option as opposed to both the Chablis? Again, anyone? I, I think that Petit Chablis are definitely the ones by the glass. Um, the problem has always been to me is in the name and it, it just sounds like a, a second rate Chablis, which of course it isn't, but that's what comes across very small, you know. Um, there's something about the name that I can never get my head around. But um, yeah, this this Chablis from Michaud, I would definitely prefer to have this with some food. No okay. Question. Okay. Great. And, and and I you know I look at and I think that's the way to introduce Petit Chablis for those people that maybe haven't had it in a long time or you know concerned about the reputation. I think having it by the glass, being able to give people almost a starter sample of it to have them see that, wow, it is, it is, it is really a great wine and perfect by the glass. But, you know, I, I, I do think that when we, it comes to the, the two Chablis that we, we just had, it, it, it is something that does need a bit of food. I mean, obviously you can drink anything on its own. Anybody can drink anything on its own if they want to, but, you know, particularly with, I would say modern cuisine, when we're looking at much more sort of fish, different inventive, you know, uh, ceviche, sushi, that type of thing. I, I, I really do think that both of them are absolutely sort of, you know, necessary sort of pairs, you know, a no brainer kind of pairs for food and wine matching. All right, let's get to, sorry. I was, I was just going to say, Michelle, uh, it's, it's Richard here. Um, I was Hi, tasting the, the Michaud um, as well. And I just thought um, the kind of I, I've got a lot of rounded character to it, which I don't necessarily associate with a lot of Chablis. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe, you know, the via vine, the oak aging and the nature of the vintage, it lends itself a bit a bit more versatile food pairings and drinking on its own rather than a kind of really austere Chablis, classic Chablis style. It, it's a bit more versatile than people might expect, which I think is a, is a bonus for, for this wine wines like it i think that's a really interesting comment so wh when you said more versatile so what type of things would you put with it well you, you can start playing with with things that maybe have a bit more uh, butter or cream in the dish sure uh, um rather than just thinking about you know sort of you know, oysters or whatever you know that kind of much more cleaner sushi style thing that people tend to talk about with chablis so yeah. things with a bit more flavor so that they can they can match up with each other Okay, terrific. Great. Okay, let's go on to the next section. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Fantastic. So the next two levels, Premier Cru and Grand Cru, and this is really the introduction of the Chablis world of Klima. 
So what is a klima? So this is the expression of terroir in Burgoyne. And, and everybody understands climas and Burgoyne. So it is the DNA. It's a precisely defined plot. And that has been defined by specific geological climactic conditions identified and enhanced by wine growers. And do keep in mind the history of this. So, you know, Climas have been written about by the Cistercians um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And actually, the very first, I think the seventh century is uh, the first time we actually had it mentioned, uh, one of the Climas uh, in Burgoyne, uh, and that's uh, Claude Abbez and Givry. But the very first writing, the word being written down as a Clima and mentioned in writing, and that's why you actually see that example on the slide, was actually in Chablis in 1537. So the reference to the word Clima um, from a document in Chablis. So let's look at the, 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 the uh, Climas in Chablis itself. So as everybody knows, we have 47 of them. Uh, 40 of them are classified premier cru and seven of them are classified as grand cru. So let's move and focus on the premier cru. That's the focus of our presentation. So we have 40 of them, which is quite a few, but 17 of them are what they call the main ones or the flagship ones. Um, and those are either the larger ones or ones that are quite well known. So a lot of names there you would recognize, uh, Monte de Tonnerre, Fauchon, Vaillant, Montmartre. So there's a number of them that I'm sure people that do recognize. And it's important to understand, and I'll show it when we get to the map next, that, that these different climats each have their own elevation. They have different expositions. Um, and so they are quite, they are quite different from each other. They're quite, they're quite unique um, from each other. Um, so if we take a look at the map, and you can really see that from the map, and you can see how some are quite small, some are quite large, both sides of the river, and you can see just the different directions some of them are facing. So some of them are almost horizontal, you know, uh, east-west. Lots of them are from, um, you know, the north-south, either facing east or facing west. Uh, so they are very, very different and quite unique. Some of them are steeper than others. Some have protection behind them. So there really is very, very different expressions uh, amongst them. So in total, just under 800 hectares, 778 uh, hectares. So because some of them are so large, we introduce the notion of what we call um, the flagship climat. And some of these flagship climos have developed their own subplots. And I think sometimes that can be a little bit confusing for people. So if we take a look at Forsham, and Forsham was on, if, on the slide. So it was the one that was north-south, and it was on the right bank. And it's quite a large clima. And their subplots have been um, um, divided up into it, and they've been given their names. So if you take a look at this particular small map, we've got L'Homme de Mort, which you can see how far north it is, and it is located within Fourchon. But if you actually look at um, uh, Côte du Fontenay, which you can see, it's actually further south, and it's a bit more in that east-west direction as a north-south. So those are both in Fourchon, but you can see they're very, very different locations and different expositions. So they themselves have developed their own personalities, and that's why they have their own names. What does it mean for a producer? A producer can do one of two things. So let's say their vines are located in L'Homme de Mort. They can use L'Homme de Mort on their label, or they can use Forchamps on their label. So it really is up to them what they, what, they, what they do. And I think you can really see this when we take a look at, we've actually got a physical picture of Forchamps. And you can see L'Homme de Mort uh, where it is and, and, and quite different than the Côte de Fontenay. And you can see how different and how far apart they physically are with different expositions, why you might have a producer that would choose uh, to use the subplot name on the label to express something different other than other than just uh, other than just for Sean. So let's take a look at our first wine. And our first wine is from the uh, Climat Moma, so Moma Premier Cru. So you can see where it is. We are looking at uh, the left bank and we're looking at the southern end of the left bank. So we are uh, looking at different exposition here. And you can just see, I know it's tiny on the map, but you can see there's little writing and Moma definitely has subplots to it. So if we actually go to our uh, first wine, you'll see a picture actually of Moma. So there we go. So the whole thing is Moment, but you can see Bouteau right at the bottom. So Bouteau is actually the furthest south 
faced in Little Bit East, and that's where our first wine is from. So this particular producer, Domaine de Chevalier, has selected to use Bouteau on the label as opposed to Moma, really expressing that particular subplot in uh, Moma. So this is quite a new estate. Uh, so started by Claude Chevalier in 1992, his daughter uh, is, is slowly been taking over uh, and running the state as well. So we've got just 0.21 hectares from Bouteau, so southeast facing vines, average age around 30 years old. And here you can actually see what we've been talking about all along. So al uh, alcoholic malolactic fermentation uh, using its own yeast in stainless steel. But now we've increased the time in oak and on fine leaves. And I do think you tend to see a little bit more layered winemaking when it comes to the climas. And, and so instead of the six months that we had seen, the five or six months, now we're going between nine and 10 months. Uh, and, and that's a fair amount of time in lees aging. That will give a different expression adding to, to that wine. So really, really adding another layer on top of it. So there are uh, two people and myself who have this. So uh, Fergus and Adulide, is that, I don't know if that's how you pronounce your name. So the three of us have this particular wine. So I'll let uh, Fergus and Adulide, if you two want to tell me what you think about the wine, like I said, I have it in front of me, but uh, if one of you uh, wants to tell us what you think. Yeah, hi, Michelle, it's Fergus. Um, I think it's quintessential Chablis. It's got that lovely sort of crushed stony oyster shell complexity to it, lovely intensity, um, a bit of weight from the vintage, but no, really, really drinking beautifully already actually as well, which I thought was um, a little bit of a surprise. I thought it might be a bit, a bit tightly coiled, but just a question about the butter labeling. My bottle doesn't mention it at all. Um, it says Moma rather than No, it does say Moma. Yeah, it is from um, Bouteau. It does say Moma. Absolutely. But, um, it does. Yeah. And um, that's their choice. That's just entirely their choice. They don't have to do that's it. An, no, that's entirely their choice. And and look, and I, I think it's 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 very personal for a producer and it has a lot to do with selling, to be honest with you. Um, you know, what are people going to recognize a little bit more, I think? Good question. Adelide, did I say that correctly? Is she there? She's got the wine as well. Um, while we're waiting, I'll give you my impression. I, I was actually, I'm not quite sure what you thought, Fergus, but when I opened it, and I opened it around, I don't know, probably around quarter to 11, I really got the oak. Um, so the oak really kind of wafted to me, and I think that's probably because we are looking at a recent. So if you actually think about this, 2018 would have gone into wood and not come out till you know sometime in 2019. So it really hasn't been in the bottle for a huge amount. So uh, compared to a couple of other Chablis, I thought I thought the, the wood was the, the wood was quite sort of obvious to it on the nose, but not in the palate. To me, on the palate, really had I agree with you that crushed stone. It had. Um, I had a richness, and I think that's the vintage, but really had a lean, tight, linear, acidic feel. So really quite lean and pursing in the mouth, uh, as well as, as lovely richness. I almost thought it was a bit of a shame I had to open this, I'll be honest with you, because I, I, I think this is this is one where I wouldn't hesitate. You know, whether you have it under Corva and, and do choose to serve it by the glass, um, or whether you buy enough of it, and you'd be happy to keep this on a wine list and not really be too worried about hanging on to it for a few years, because I think uh, if you take anybody taste the 15s now, the, the aging and the potential to keep and develop and really add tertiary characters is, is quite, is uh, quite substantial. So I don't know what anybody else thinks of that. Okay, great. Thank you, Fergus. Um, let's go to uh, our next one. And that is from the Climat Vaillon. So you can see where Vaillon is. Again, we're looking at another left bank, another quite larger, but maybe not quite as long, uh, a little bit wider. And you can see with the writing, there is lots of um, subplots within it as well, uh, within uh, Vaillon. So if we take a look at a picture of it, there we go. 
and you can actually you can actually see the different expositions. So I don't know if anyone can see, but actually you can see sort of the downward different expositions on Vaillant. This particular wine, Siganot Bordet, uh, is actually from Vaillant. It's not from one of the subplots. So it's actually from sort of uh, Vaillant itself, and not from a subplot. Uh, and this is a really historic producer. So 19 generations, I'm not quite sure how many business can actually uh, say that. So in the 19th uh, generation, uh, they've got 19 hectares as well. Um, uh, so they've got quite old vines here, 40 to 55 years old, uh, done in stainless steel. They have done malolactic as well on this. And I think what's fascinating about this, you've got um, the youngest generation, Jean-Francois, who's making the wine, Bordet is making the wine, and they've recently renovated the cellar. And he's got a very different choice. So he actually has horizontal stainless steel containers that he ages his wines in. So it really is uh, quite a protective winemaking that he's looking at. So all done in stainless steel and then aging it in stainless steel, but on its side. So you've got six months of fine leaves. So quite a big difference between this one and the previous wine, which had six months uh, in oak. So um, I thought this 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 was a you know a very different a very different imprint um, of of the impression of the wine and very different wine making. Although it is something I do see with a younger generation, people that are uh, starting to use a lot more protective wine making with it um, with these wines. So there's a number of you that have it. Nine people do have this wine. So I would love I don't have it, so I'd love to hear what people think about it. Hi, it's uh, Nick here. Um, yeah, I've got this. It's certainly, um, I get a bit more colour in this wine compared to the straight Chablis. Um, it's certainly very crisp and zesty on the palate. It's very lean. It's still pretty tight, I think, and uh, I guess needs needs a bit more time. But um, nice example of crisp stainless steel Chablis, I think. Great, thanks. Anyone else want to add to that? Hi, it's Leona. Hi. Uh, Hi, yeah, Leona. I Hi, I agree with Nick. I, the, my impression is that it does need a bit more time. It's very complex at the moment. Really zesty, easty, everything's going on, a lot of things going on, but it feels like uh, it's slightly a bit quite young at the moment it's uh, quite tight and everything so uh but then i can see there's loads of things got the white peach and uh you know lots of mineral note and a bit of creaminess as well but just felt that it does need a bit of time and it, I, I i'm pretty sure you will be much much you know broader and better in probably at least a couple of years time that's Sorry, just thank you <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's both of you are kind of saying the same thing, which I think is really interesting. And I, and I do think, look, you know, putting in a bit of wood, bringing on uh, those tertiary, what I call bottle age characteristics is kind of speeding things up. So having something that's made all reductively all in stainless steel is a very different expression. It is a very tight, as you've all said, expression of it. So I do find that find that fascinating. Any any anyone else? Yep. Michelle, I, I, I agree with the others. I think this would be fabulous just to uh, leave for a couple of years and then open because I think it's um, it's got huge potential um, and it's such a pity you know, to actually have opened it today. You know, it's, it's one of those forgotten wines that you leave at the back and then in three, four years time you open up and go, wow, where did that yeah. come from? Yeah, and, 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 and again, I, that's part of the ethos of the producer really is to just have this freshness and this protection uh, to aid the longevity of it. So it, it is interesting. So, we, you know, it's a very different winemaking from what we've seen. So that's great, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, for talking about that. So, oops, sorry. Let's go on to uh, our next wine. And our next one is Montemilieu. And this is uh, our, our, this is actually from the right bank. So, um, close-ish to the Grand Cruz and a bit smaller, as you can see. So it is, it is, uh, it is definitely sort of uh, smaller, although it still is a flagship. I think it's, when you see the picture of it on the next side, I think you can see it's a bit more interesting in that uh, it is a bit more uh, what I would call um, west to east in its, in its orientation, uh, but quite steep slopes. 
Um, so the picture will show you that on the next slide. There we go. And the other thing to look at when you do look at this, you can actually see where you've got this little mini forest behind it. And what that does is protect it from the north wind. And that's really critical to Montemilieu. Uh, so we've got steep slopes, a bit of protection. Obviously, you don't get that protection a little bit further to the east, but steep slopes, protection, very homogeneous in sort of the plot selection here that, that it does, that it does um, produce. They get sort of beautiful, really consistent ripening here. So it is one of these um, premier crus that, that, that people do discover and do, and do really, really love. There is, I always find there's just a little bit more richness in Mont Milieu uh, in comparison to, uh, to some other wines. So if we actually look at their producer, and this is Domaine Aventura. Um, and again, quite a young, only 2014, 11 hectares of vines. Um, so really just still discovering sort of the different terroirs and playing around with them. Uh, so we got just 0.2 hectares in Montemilieu, very old vines, 48 years old. Um, so again, uh, alcoholic, malolactic and stainless steel. But previous um, to the Bouteau, we've got 10 months in oak on fine leaves. So, you know, we've got sort of either end in oak and the one in the middle without, uh, without any oak. So three people have this wine. Uh, we've got um, Emma, Richard and Karen do have this wine. So tell us what you think. Uh, Michelle, Karen. Um... I think this, from the comments on the previous wine, this feels very different. Um, for 2018, it's it's drinking very well. Um, it has a, a richness of, of uh, on the nose and texturally as well. It has a richness um, on the palate, but it's also it has that very shabbly uh, linearity and precision that you would expect. Um, and I think. Um, it's not particularly a technical term, but it's an, it's an incredibly appetizing wine. It's really quite delicious, um, but I found it very, very appetizing. Terrific, thank you. Anybody else? Don't know whether Richard or Emma are still on the call. Hi, yes, it's Emma. Um, Hi, Emma. Hey, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with what was just said, and it, it really is a delicious wine. Um, it is quite complex, got a lovely richness to it. Um, definitely getting a lot of like green apples, tart lemon, and like very typical Chablis, but as coming from 2018, it's drinking quite well at the moment. Um, I mean, I would like to see it, how it would develop maybe over a couple of years, but even if I opened it now, it's, it's not drinking too badly and it's very enjoyable. Terrific, thank you. I don't know whether Richard Yep, you're the last person who's got this, whether you have had this or whether Richard's still on the call or not. Unless there's another Richard. Uh, I no, have, you're the yeah. only one. <laughs> I know, I did check, you're the only one. <laughs> I, I actually had the the other one, the, the oh, Seguin of Bordeaux, so All yeah. Right. So that's mine. Okay, I had you having this one. Anybody else got this one? No, okay. Great. I think both 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 Emma and both Karen, I think, really express what I think is a consistent term with Montemilieu. There is a lovely sort of ripeness and a richness to it, which does enable sort of immediate drinking. But you are so rewarded when you age this wine. And I, I do think that's very, very true. So let's finish off the uh, Premier Cruz as far as uh, food and wine. I'm going to assume most people serve this by the bottle. I don't know if anybody corvans anything under the glass. Um, and if anybody wants to talk about what they what they serve Premier Cru with, how they serve it, does anybody want to give me a comment? Uh, I think it's pretty typical that you are going to, I mean, I think seafood is always going to be, you know, the typical. Um, but I think everybody, what they've talked about, there's just a bit more weight, more complexity to these wines that they absolutely, it's a bit, it's a bit like when we talked about the Vavine, it absolutely could go with, you know, something a little bit, a little bit richer. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the, these wines wouldn't be out of place in that, particularly when you age them and you do bring on tertiary characteristics. I think that's even enhanced with it as well. So we'll just finish up and I'll just give you a brief little um, 
uh, sort of look at Grand Cru. We have no Grand Cru wines today, but a brief little look at Grand Cru. As we said, it's just that small area on the right bank. It's 101 hectares. Uh, minimum aging, so they do have to, they cannot release this until March 15th, the year after the harvest. So, for example, if they harvest it in September 2019, you cannot release a Grand Cru until March 2020, March 15th, 2020. However, that being said, most of them will age it and will release it later than that. So, if we take a look at uh, a map of it, and you can see the split here. And you can see approximately the different sizes. So there's seven of them. And I, what I like about this map, this really quite shows you that there are some Grand Cru's that are higher in elevation and a little bit steeper, and they will give a little bit different expression, uh, for example, than Les Clos uh, or Bougreau, uh, which are a little bit further closer to the river, do get sort of reflection from the river, and, and uh, the grapes are a bit whiter because of that, and it's a bit richer wine. So each of them have their own expression and you can see uh, an actual visual picture of it uh, and you can you can actually see where you've got uh, you've got a bit of a forest again behind not all of them but some of them giving you that protection and kind of seeing where they are so if we just take a look at sizes of hectares you can actually see how large some of these are and right in the middle 27 hectares Les Clos, one of the most historical ones is the largest uh, and it's, to me, it's always the one that has the biggest richness to it. Uh, and then you get the smallest one here by Grenoble. Uh, and then everything is sort of average, 11, 15, Bougreau, Blanchot, uh, Preuse. And, you know, if you ever get a chance to have all of them, it, it, they really do express sort of different, different elements to it. And again, similar food pairing, it, it is, these are richer expressions. I do find they tend to have more wood to it. They do tend to have malolactic. They do tend to have that uh, longer lease aging. So when we're seeing that 10 months, that might be a year, it might be a little bit longer than that. Um, so that's sort of very, very typical with, um, uh, with Grand Cru. So I'll just finish up with uh, conclusions because I know people have jobs to do and lunch to have. So just sort of a one page of uh, everything that we've talked about today. One grape, Kimmeridge and soil, four levels of Appalachians, just under 57 hectares of vines, sold in 100 countries. Um, and the next slide I absolutely love, if we can see the next slide. And this is artist's impression of what minerality is. And they went to uh, artists who are photographers to uh, give you an impression of minerality, so different elements of minerality. Uh, so they went to um, uh, artists in, in Germany and Belgium, um, so their image of minerality. So for me, there is no, Shadley is Shadley. It's unique, it's one of a kind, um, you know, and it is everything that we did talk about. It is that expression of Chardonnay and that particular place in the world. So um, thank you for being with me. I'll open it up to any questions. And if Francois is on this call, we have a question particularly for her. Any questions? Um, I've got a quick question, if that's OK. Yeah, Richard, sure. Sure. Um, so normally when I've been told to buy wine, I've always been told to buy the producer first, then look at the climat or the vintage. Um, so in Chablis, <clears throat> there's actually probably one, possibly two producers where their Grand Cru's are incredibly expensive compared to other producers. Yeah. So say for instance, you buy a uh, William Frev Le Clou. It's, that's a, you, could, you know, it's a pretty reasonable price that a lot of people I would think could get a bottle at. But then you look at Raveno Le Clou, and then you see a massive, massive price difference. If they're essentially harvesting from the same climat, would you then say that the producer's vinification methods are much much more different or because the, the massive price disparity i mean the grapes should be technically more or less the same shouldn't they or uh it's a very good question <laughs> look at it's uh, i i i think it's like it, it, it's like talking about you know why is 
you know, why is somebody's uh, Chambertin more expensive than somebody else's Chambertin? You can say that in uh, saint mille premier grand cru classe as well. Um, look at, I, I think always producers are going to have different popularity. They're gonna, they're gonna be maybe collected a little bit wider. Um, there is going to be an element of vinification, but as far as price, I think that that really depends on how well known they are. There is a bit of marketing to to you know to that as well, and there is some winemakers that make something maybe a little bit accessible. They want it drunk now as opposed to later, uh, and and maybe that's because you know they 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 would like to you know like I said they, and, and other producers that that don't so they're a little bit leaner, a little bit tighter, want their wines to age a little bit more. So as far as winemaking, there's slight differences in winemaking, so there's slight differences in philosophy, but I think it has more to do with probably named recognized names. That being said, when you, you get a chance to taste a lot of different Grand Cru's, there are differences. And I think yeah. in Le Clos in particular, that's a large clima, 27 hectares. Mm -hmm. So there are, I think, a little bit more price differentiation because yeah. of the size of that particular clima and the expression of the <clears throat> producers in that particular clima. But it's a really good question. Awesome. Any, other, any, other, any other question? Um, just from a price point of view, from the Premier Cruz, again, that depends on producer, but anywhere from sort of 25 up to 30-ish, I think, for a Premier Cru, uh, price differentiation uh, that we're seeing for that. Um, I, I've got a little question. Um, yeah. It's Theo, which is, where do we see the future of Chablis, given its northerly situation in France and what we're seeing happening with global warming and how the weather is changing um, slowly, but also very quickly? So, I mean, yeah. Chablis was it'd be interesting to know your thoughts on that it's a really really good question and and i think the only other area i think that that's kind of looking at it very similarly is champagne because they're not that far apart as i said with winemaking earlier it is the use of malolactic that i think will probably change so when we do have warmer vintages like 2018, like 2015, we're starting to see this. Any of you that are that are that know Champagne well, you're starting to see the use of malolactic change. Where in Chablis, it was pretty standard. These were pretty austere wines with pretty high acidity. Malolactic wasn't to add butter. Malolactic was to soften that acidity. Really, that's what it was for, as opposed to deacidification. So, in answer your question, Theo, I think you're going to see people playing around with malolactic a little bit more, maybe holding back and maybe only doing half a batch that, that let it let it go through mallow and then suppress it in the other batch and and then blend it. I think you're going to be looking at different site selections as well, probably a little bit earlier picking time. But I think there is going to be ultimately there's going to be a little bit of a style change. I think you're going to see a little bit riper grapes. I think we've seen that in 2015. You know, somebody talked. I can't remember who talked about 2017. You do see that 2017 lower volume, but you do see some ripeness. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think people quite like it as long as you still have that steeliness. So I think that slight bit more ripeness, maybe slightly early harvesting, playing around and suppressing mallow a little bit to keep that same linear expression um, that we all know and love. I also think they might start playing around with a bit of wood. Maybe use a bit less, maybe do what um, uh, what the other producer did and, and a bit more stainless steel. So there's a couple of things I think that that I think you'll start seeing with the younger generation in the future. Good question though. Any other questions? Okay, great. Um, Francoise, are you on the call? I can't see if Francoise is on the call. Bertil, do we know if Francoise is on the call? So Ryan, we're gonna get back to so, yeah. yeah. Ryan, we're going to get back to you about Grand Cru, but to my knowledge, I don't know of any Premier Cru that is trying to become Grand Cru. I think I'm sure think they all would like to be, but uh, we'll get we'll 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 get, we'll get back to you on that and let you know. Are you on the call next week, Ryan? Uh, no, but I'll uh, I'll follow up. <laughs> Do follow up. We'll let Thanks, you know. Michelle. It's I, been super I will interesting. Specifically ask her. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I love the engagement. Uh, you know, we were supposed to do this at trade itself, and there is nothing more I would love but to be at trade and to actually see all of you. But um, thanks for the engagement. I hope you really, really enjoy the wines. And uh, we've got uh, a, a Petit Chablis presentation next week. So if you can join, that would be fantastic. But uh, have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. 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 Bye.